Hi everyone, it's Mr. Vallejo. Today I'll be taking a look at organic chemistry with you. So let's share the screen. And remember these PowerPoint notes are going to be available for you in Canvas. So you can take a look at those there at your own pace. Also, uh, the, the archived lecture, the recording of, of this talk right here will be available uh, shortly after we're done. Hopefully a lot more, a lot quicker than the last time. We had some issues, uh, it was a little long, so I had to uh, load it to uh, YouTube instead of our, our normal uh, posting method. So uh, bear with us when it comes to things like that. All righty, organic chemistry. Uh, now organic chemistry is a different form from inorganic chemistry. Um, organic chemistry is the chemistry of life, and in particular, taking a look at large macromolecules that are, that are based on carbon. I'll cover all that as we go. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is the organizing slide for part one. We're gonna take a look at uh, the term organic, and I'll show you what some functional groups are that are especially important in, in biological um, organisms. Um, we'll give you the difference between macromolecules and polymers. We'll also see how those macromolecules are formed by dehydration synthesis reactions and taken apart by hydrolysis reactions. All right, when something's organic, what that means is it costs a lot. Just kidding. Um, I know that those prices are coming down at, at Costco. If you have a, uh, the sign that tells you how much something is, if it's bright green, that means it's, uh, it's organic. Um, it used to be that you go to uh, Whole Foods or uh, uh, Trader Joe's and pay a lot more for organic substance. But really what organic means is that it contains carbon. And it also means it's, it's a product of a living thing. Um, it could be uh, currently alive or the, uh, the body of a, a dead organism or uh, something that came from that living thing like uh, fingernails or hair. Um, those might be considered organic substances. Now, life is based on carbon. Uh, we learned this uh, last time that when, when you figure out the P and E for carbon, you can figure out from the periodic table of elements that carbon requires six protons, or it has six protons, and because it has six protons, it has uh, six matching electrons. Those electrons are negatively charged compared to the positively charged uh, protons. So also by the octet rule that we went over last time, uh, it, the outermost shell uh, contains eight electrons. So if we have six carbon, uh, six electrons with uh, two in the first shell and four in that second shell, to complete, complete that second shell, carbon has to form four more covalent bonds. So what carbon will do to get rid of those two of those uh, requirements is to join with two other carbon atoms. So if this carbon right here needs four covalent bonds, it'll join with this one over here and this one over here, and it'll make a long chain. This one has 13, but that's just, I ran out of room. If you uh, look at a protein uh, mo uh, molecule, protein molecules made of uh, hundreds and hundreds of carbon, uh, carbon atoms, okay? <clears throat> Now carbon chains vary in many different ways. You can see in this diagram here that, that these are straight here. You have this straight chain of carbon. Sometimes they're branched like you see here in, in isobutane. Uh, you can also have double bonds right here and even triple bonds. But the most common form is to form a ring. It's most stable um, energetically. And so long molecules especially will form rings. Uh, that are depicted in this way, uh, basically. And there are other ways to draw uh, a ring pattern uh, called a chair pattern when you get to higher organic chemistry because it looks uh, like a two-dimensional chair. So uh, rings, uh, rings are the most stable form of uh, the configuration for, for a large carbon molecule. So these large carbon molecules that we study in organic chemistry are hydrocarbons. Um, many of them, and they, when you have a hydrocarbon, hydrocarbons are made up of hydrogen and, and carbon. 
uh, says there's some carbon compounds or isomers, they'll have the same formula. And that formula um, might be something like C612, uh, C6H12O6, which means that there's six um, atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen, and six atoms of oxygen. But there are several different carbon compounds that have that same exact molecular formula, but they have uh, a different configuration. That is to say, they have uh, the oxygens in a, in a different place, the carbons that are uh, situated slightly differently. So um, those types of molecules are called isomers. If we take apart this word, iso means same. Like uh, in mathematics, you have an isosceles triangle that has two sides that are the same. Um, an isometric exercise might be when you push your hands together like that and push as hard as you can with your right and your left. It's called an isometric exercise. And so I'm really staying in the same place. I might be shaking after a while, but uh, iso means the same. So they have the same formula, these chemicals but they have a different structure. Now, um, organic molecules are gonna have functional groups attached to them. It's a really long chemical, a really long molecule, but it has uh, functional groups attached to them. Here's a diagram that shows you uh, many of those functional groups. Uh, most of these are highly important in, in biological uh, chemicals that are uh, involved in, in living systems. So the first one is called a hydroxyl group. It's just right here. It's an O and an H. Whenever you have an O and an H, no matter how long this thing is here, this one has only two carbons. But if it had 22 carbons and it had an OH attached to it, it would still be, this is still called a hydroxyl group. And that chemical with 22 carbons and a hydroxyl group attached to it is considered to be an alcohol. If you have any chemical that ends in OL, then that is, uh, you know that that's a, an alcohol that has a hydroxyl group attached to it. This third one over here is the carboxyl group. The carboxyl group is COOH, as you can see here, but the C, the O, the O, then the H are arranged this way. So when you have this uh, functional group, this is uh, called a carboxyl group. And if you take a look at a chemical and it ends in IC acid, sometimes they call it an ic acid. Um, like formic acid, like aspartic acid, all of these acids have this carboxyl group attached right here. Um, sometimes the carboxyl group will lose that uh, H right there in this diagram right over here. We say that's the ionized form that has a charge to it, and then that H will go back and uh, it'll flip over to the uh, to the uncharged form, the neutral form, and go back and forth. So a little bit later, I'll be taking a look at cellular respiration with you. And one chemical that's important is called pyruvic acid, but it also changes over to pyruvate. When you have the ionized form, uh, it ends in ATE. A couple more functional groups. This one's called the amino group, and you can see it right here. Here's an N, two H's attached to it. If you see something with an amino group, uh, and then also a carboxyl group attached to it. That's known as an amino acid. And amino acids are the chemicals that make up proteins. So we're gonna see that in a little bit. And then finally, this is very important. This is, these are phosphate groups right here. And this is so big, they just wrote a, adenosine right here. That's really a very large molecule. But attached to this adenosine, you have three of these phosphate groups. Now, between the second and the third phosphate group, uh, there's a bond, and that bond is a high energy bond. And when you break that bond, it results in a lot of energy. So ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency molecule. So when, uh, when you take the food in your body uh, in the form of uh, a simple, uh, simple carbohydrate called the monosaccharide, what's gonna happen in your body is that uh, the, uh, the cells are going to, at their mitochondria, uh, make ATP. And essentially they'll have, it almost built, they'll have A, which is adenosine, and two of these phosphate groups, but they're gonna add on this third phosphate group. And as they add on that third phosphate group, they're creating more and more ATP so that when you need to do something, it's time for you to move, then um, that energy in that, that uh, 
that bond between the second and third ATP will be able to, to be uh, used for, um, for whatever processes that uh, you're trying to engage in. So that's the amino group, that's the third functional group, and then the phosphate group is that right there. Now, you might think, well, what, what difference does that make? Well, if you take a look over here, just this one difference in this functional group, just losing that H changes estradiol to testosterone. Uh, testosterone, you probably are familiar with, it's the male hormone. Estradiol is a major female hormone. So just that little bitty change makes a big difference. And those, um, as you can imagine, hormones um, in other animals um, have the same effect as, as they do in, in people. And they have all kinds of uh, other secondary characteristics that are the result of having a particular hormone. So organic molecules are large molecules, they're macromolecules. That's what the, the term macromolecules, if you break that apart, macro means large, molecule is the, is the uh, basic um, <coughs> chemical structure. Uh, when we have a, a compound, it's just made up of multiple elements. So cells make the most of their macromolecules by joining smaller organic molecules into chains called polymers. These smaller organic molecules are, are parts and if you uh, take apart this word, a monomer, mono is a one, and mer is the basic building block. So this is one building block. And to make a macromolecule, you would put all a bunch of these uh, monomers together. And you probably know from mathematics, the prefix poly. Poly means many. So you're gonna take a bunch of monomers, stick them together and make a polymer. And this really long molecule that's a polymer is also a macromolecule. Sometimes we say it's like a it's like a brick house. Because some of you live in stucco houses, but some of you live in brick houses. And uh, the contractor joke is, how do you build a brick house? And the way you build a brick house is one brick at a time. So uh, that's the same thing as a polymer. You're going to build your polymers one monomer at a time. And when you build it, you're going to have to stick them together with some mortar. Uh, if you're still building bricks, but if you're building chemicals, uh, what you need to do is to stick it together uh, by the process called the dehydration synthesis reaction or just the dehydration reaction. In this diagram here, you can see why it's called the dehydration reaction because water is being lost. What you do is take the hydrogen off of one side and the, uh, uh, the hydroxyl group off another side, and then you stick those two together and then you get some water. And so because these guys are going to be gone, these light blue ones here, the purple ones are going to join together. That's a slightly longer chemical, slightly longer macromolecule, a slightly longer polymer. So that's a dehydration reaction. The reverse reaction is called hydrolysis. Now to take that word apart, hydro means water. Lysis you might be able to figure out. Um, I think that uh, that uh, as, a, as a guy I can, and as a dad, I can fix all kinds of different things. If I have duct tape or zip ties or drywall screws, uh, I can fix just about anything. Um, those are some really good inventions. If you ask my wife what some really good inventions are, um, she might say disposable diapers, because we have uh, our first grandkid in the house. Um, but uh, another thing that she's very fond of is Lysol disinfecting wipes. Any fans? All right. Now, Lysol, the term Lysol uh, comes, uh, as you may know that Lysol is a, dis, uh, the disinfecting wipes are known to, to kill bacteria. It used to be on their label. I never still does. On the label it says, kills 99.4% of all bacteria, something like that. Well, how does it do that? Well, the idea to lice means to split. So Lysol, the chemicals in Lysol are gonna split your bacteria in half and then they'll be gone. So um, hydro, lysis, that means water split. And you're gonna take this water molecule right here and you're gonna split it. And as you split it, you're gonna join those parts onto the, uh, uh, the uh, longer macromolecule to break it down into smaller pieces. 
Okay, so that's the first half of the talk today. In the second half of the talk today, we're gonna take a look at types of organic molecules. We'll see that there were four types of organic molecules. There's carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Nucleic acids, I won't go much into today because we have uh, several lectures coming up that have to do with biochemistry and nucleic acids. But for carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, we'll go into some detail. For each of these types of organic, organic molecules, you'll need to know what these organic molecules do, their job or function, uh, what the monomer is, uh, what the basic building block is, what is the brick that makes the brick house, and then be able to tell us some examples. Um, in this week's lab, you're going to fill out a chart, and that chart has uh, requires you to know this information. All this information can be found in this PowerPoint and in this lecture. So you should be able to do well as you complete the handout that is part of this week's lab. All right, this is an organizing slide, a, a review slide for the carbohydrates. You can already see what the monomer is of a carbohydrate. Uh, all carbohydrates are made up of, of saccharides or specifically monosaccharides. Uh, a monosaccharide is one sugar. Uh, a disaccharide is another type of carbohydrate. It has two sugars, sometimes it's called a double sugar. And then over here we have the polysaccharides. These are complex sugars or starches. Um, these are the polysaccharides made up of many sugar subunits. And you can see also the job is listed and I gave you some examples of all these. So this is a really good slide for the carbohydrate, but let's go into a little bit more detail. As we take a look at the monosaccharides, again, they're the monomer of all carbohydrates. Um, the job is they're the basic food molecule that's in our bloodstream, and glucose is an example of this. Um, these bees are making honey, uh, which has dextrose in it, which is glucose, and, and so uh, that uh, explains the, the diagram there. Uh, quick funny story, I used to have a beehive in my backyard and as a biologist, I always thought that was cool. But when my, uh, uh, when my wife said, you gotta get rid of the beehive, it's stinging all the kids. We have seven kids and we've always had at least two dogs. You have to get rid of the beehive. Um, you know, I always thought they'd vacuum it up and, and take it out to the pasture and, uh, and, and all those bees would go free and pollinate some flowers. But I guess we called the wrong guy. And that guy came out with a smoker, and when he couldn't get it all done, he put some chemical in there, and all the bees were gone. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, the funny thing about this, uh, as a uh, as a biologist, uh, the day we did this was April 22nd, which you may know as Earth Day. So we killed all the bees on Earth Day. All right, uh, monosaccharide has a formula that looks like this, CH2O. Sometimes you have an N down here as a subunit. Instead of the six, you might have a small letter N. That means it's all basically twice as many hydrogens as the same amount of carbons and oxygens. Uh, like here, carbon and oxygen's about the same, and then uh, you have twice as many hydrogens. Um, there's a little bit of uh, change in, on that when it gets the larger, larger. Um, polymers, uh, polysaccharides, because each time you have a bond between two, as you know already, that's due to water. So you've got to subtract uh, two H's and an O each time. So that's why for a double sugar, it might be C12H22 instead of 24, O11 instead of 12. So a monosaccharide has that formula with twice as many um, hydrogens compared to carbons and oxygens. Here's a diagram which shows you some isomers I mentioned already before, so I'm going to go through this, but um, but you can see uh, before we leave this slide, uh, the difference, uh, they, they have the same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens, same number of oxygen, but they do have a slightly different structure, glucose and fructose. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the most stable form is uh, to have the these chemicals form rings, and so you can see it there. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, here is a, the next type of carbohydrate. This is called a, a disaccharide. And with the disaccharides here, here's some examples that are underlined for you. Sucrose, maltose, lactose. 
Um, obviously, they are made up of the disaccharides, they're made up of monosaccharides. And their job is they're a little more stable, so they might be um, considered for transport, maybe e either within the body or uh, they might be more stable outside the body. Like, you know, you can have milk sitting around for a little while. Um, sugar doesn't change and break down into monosaccharides right away if you just have it sitting out. So this one's called maltose. The, the most commonly known sugar probably is sucrose though, and sucrose is made up of uh, one glucose, like this one here, and another uh, monosaccharide called galactose. So those are disaccharides. Um, here's a, a slide I'm just gonna go through real quick. Um, this uh, illustrates the uh, how sweeteners work, and you can see here that uh, this, is, uh, this is the blue stuff, uh, which is equal. Sucralose is the uh, yellow Splenda, and then saccharin is, is sweet and low, which comes in a pink, pink packet. So you can see that they are, uh, you can see the, the relative sweetness to, fruit, uh, to sucrose over here, which is our typical table sugar. But what these chemicals do is they bind to sweet receptors on the tongue, and that's how, how those work. Um, I am lactose intolerant, I'm, um, I, I must say, and many people in the world, though, suffer from lactose intolerance. Uh, what that is is that you lack an enzyme to digest the lactose. Actually, actually this uh, was not a problem for me until my early 20s, and then I started to develop uh, lactose intolerance. Uh, if I had my favorite cereal, uh, which is Fruity Pebbles, uh, with some milk, uh, I'm okay with after the first bowl. But who can have one bowl of Fruity Pebbles so if you keep going? That's when I start getting crampy all right here. So uh, lactose, and you can have different issues that you might have uh, that come with lactose intolerance. Uh, about half of all people who are black or Latino or Asian uh, will become lactose intolerant. Uh, in their lifetime, um, or if also if you are non-white Caucasian, you also have a very high chance of getting lactose intolerance. So that's many of us uh, in this classroom. So you have monosaccharides, disaccharides, and also polysaccharides. Remember, these are all carbohydrates, and so they're all made up of monosaccharides. Um, and there are three different uh, examples of polysaccharides that I'll mention. There's starches, starches store energy and they're found in plants. Similarly, there's a chemical called glycogen in our body. So this glycogen stores energy in the form of sugar for later use in animals. Um, uh, you may have some experience with, uh, with distance running or maybe you run a 5K or 10K. Sometimes when you, when you have a, a 10k, uh, you'll have a you know if it's out of out of town or something. You drive into town the day before, and then they have a a social the night before, uh, where they serve a lot of pasta. And the idea is that you the pasta that you eat that night will turn into this glycogen, uh, and glycogen is available uh, for you to use during your race. And if you but careful if you have too much of this stuff, it just turns to fat. And then there's cellulose. Cellulose is also a polysaccharide, but plants don't have skeletons, but plants do have uh, a, a strong cell wall around each of their cells. So that cell wall is made of cellulose. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a structural polysaccharide. And so here's some pictures. Oh, here's the job. Is both the store energy and structure, depending on which which one of these examples you pick. And here's a diagram that shows you starch, glycogen, and cellulose, and how they might be found in in, uh, in these different uh, living structures. Uh, this is the glycogen in the farmer's uh, tissues right there, and then you have starch and cellulose in the plants. All right, the second uh, group of organic molecules that I need to cover today with you are the lipids. The lipids are fats, oils, or waxes. You probably have heard of liposuction. So um, that might point you to, oh, fats, those are fats. And uh, lipids are really good at storing energy. They can uh, produce, one uh, when you burn off one gram 
of lipids, it results in nine uh, food calories, also called K-Cal to a chemist. And lipids also are involved in uh, insulation and organ support, even though their primary job is energy storage. Here's some examples of fats, oils, and waxes uh, in your foods, and so here's some fatty foods. Here's some, some oils right there, and here's a funny for you, the Earwax Museum, that's the wax right there. Now, as we uh, recall what we are supposed to remember for all these different chemicals, you need to know what makes up these chemicals, the monomers, you need to know what their main functions are, and then you need some examples. So as far as fats go, fats are uh, molecules whose main function is energy storage. And they're made up a little bit different from, from carbohydrates because they're made up of three fatty acids. These are some long uh, hydrocarbons right there. And they may or may not have a double bond in them. If they have a double bond, it's called an unsaturated fatty acid. So this whole, whole thing is an unsaturated fat. Um, you may have, if you have just one, that's a monounsaturated fat, which is um, actually something that some people add to their diets. Uh, but if you have a, a polyunsaturated fat, that's one that's not so great for you uh, in your diet. So you have this fatty acids, but then you also have a glycerol molecule here. This glycerol molecule it ends in OL, so it's an alcohol, and it has those hydroxyl groups right here. You're going to need three instances of dehydration synthesis to add these fatty acids onto these hydroxyl groups. So those are fats. Here's an example of a fat. Uh, lard is an example of a fat. Fats are solid at room temperature and they typically come from animals. Uh, my mom used to say bacon grease, bacon fat, which was uh, great for cooking, right? Not so great for your arteries, but uh, you never had a tortilla fried up in bacon grease. You are missing out. So um, not the healthiest thing. But it tastes good. Um, so lard is similar to that, and it is a uh, uh, yeah, it is solid and comes from an animal. This slide right here looks a lot like this slide right here, and that's because all I did was change the title from fats to oils because they also uh, oils that is oils have their main function is energy storage, and they have the same monomers. They have a glycerol and has not just one fatty acid, but three fatty acids attached. An example of an oil is uh, the extra virgin olive oil that you see in the picture. Uh, they're, they're liquid at room temperature and they come from plants. So that is what an oil is. Think of other oils. You have vegetable oil comes from plants. Peanut oil comes from plants. Coconut oils all come from plants. All right, waxes. Waxes are a little bit different. They can be solid or liquid at room temperature. They can uh, be from plants or animals. In this picture here, you can see that these waxes form uh, waterproof coatings. And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, you know, you have candle wax, you have uh, bees wax. And so these are animal plant origins. Um, waxes are. Are, have a slightly different uh, structure as we will take a look at that in a little bit, but some waxes do have the same structure as as the other uh, uh, lipids do. Um, I mentioned that waxes have a strange structure. Here's, another, here's some more chemicals that have a slightly different structure. Uh, these are phospholipids and steroids. You can see this is a, the chemical structure of a, they have a steroid, but they all act similarly. And so that's why uh, we classify them together as lipids. Now, steroids, like we did in the previous slide right here, steroids uh, can be used uh, for for uh, purposes other than their intended purposes. And anabolic steroids are, as you can see, synthetic variants of testosterone, and can you know if taken, ingested, impose health risk. <clears throat> um, this slide is, uh, is a breakdown of the nutrition facts label, but really what I'm trying to tell you is that 
fats are really good at, at storing energy, twice as good as a protein or carbohydrate. If you have a longer nutrition facts label, it'll actually tell you that at the very bottom, it will tell you that uh, you get uh, one food calorie or capital C cal, so nine cal per gram, whereas proteins and carbohydrates will only give you four. Some other functions of lipids include insulation. Um, this, uh, this is a mammal, a whale is a mammal. And, and so mammals are warm blooded. Uh, they're what, what we call endotherms. They have an internal heat pump that, that uh, produces all the heat, just like you and I do. You know, we eat so that we can, uh, we can stay at a, at a fairly high temperature at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So what about whales that live in the ocean? Well, they uh, have a, lower body temperature, but not so low that, not, not 55 degrees low. And so uh, they require some insulation and uh, not just some insulation, but a lot of insulation. And the whales uh, will have, uh, depending on how large they are, they may have a foot, a foot of insulation, uh, a foot of lipids, a foot of, a foot of blubber that holds that temperature in. Uh, lipids are also used for organ support. Um, a, a typical, American uh, male is 15 to 25% uh, body fat, and uh, females a little bit more than that. I, I will tell you my sister-in-law, Kathy, uh, she, uh, when, when she was younger, she was recruited by a, a uh, I think it was a division two school for soccer. And so she had to get really, really fit. And uh, I know they were looking at her her body fat, and she actually got it down to 3% or so. And she said, oh, I want to get that down to 0%. Like 0%, that is not safe because you need a little bit of fat at least to support your organs. On top of your kidneys, whenever you see the term renal, that's your kidneys. And on top of your kidneys are glands called adrenal glands or your adrenal glands. Those, have a, uh, those require uh, a certain amount of fat for them to work correctly. So um, organ support, if, imagine if you didn't have that fat, your organs, your internal organs, your, your, your pancreas, your spleen, your intestine would be bumping up against your, the inside of your, your uh, rib cage, which would not be healthy. So um, I've got a picture of Kathy here when she was uh, right before she got recruited for, uh, for soccer. Um, there she is, hi Kath. The third group are the proteins. And the proteins, as uh, you can see, uh, they're uh, monomers or amino acids. And these guys are made up of, uh, well, these are examples of some foods that have uh, proteins, you know, chicken breast and fish and protein powder. Um, as you're filling out your, uh, your chart, uh, you can add, use those for examples. Um, real chemical examples though, the, the, the proteins in your fingernail and your hair, that's called keratin. If it ends in an IN, it's probably a protein, like hemoglobin is a type of protein. So those are some uh, more specific examples if you don't want to uh, list food examples. This is the organizer slide for proteins. You can see that uh, they have a few different jobs. They can be enzymes, they can uh, make up the structure of a person, but they also can be chemical messengers. Um, their uh, building blocks are um, the amino acids, the monomers are, of a protein is that they are amino acids. And uh, you have uh, uh, these amino acids held together by a particular type of bond called a peptide bond. And if we have time, we'll take a look at structure. Um, the roles of proteins, again, listed right here. And uh, enzymes, we'll have a whole talk on and we'll see how they regulate chemical reactions, how they lower the amount of energy that's required to start a chemical reaction. Um, next to water, the most common thing in your body is proteins, so they are structural, and sometimes, uh, uh, not just sometimes, many times in your body, the messages that need to go from one tissue to another are, are delivered uh, chemically uh, by these proteins. So there might be, there might be a protein receptor, on a cell in a, in a different tissue. So as, the, as your blood flows throughout your body um, and you increase the amount of some chemical messengers that you might need, then the, uh, the cells in the target cell 
would be able to sense the, the message that comes from the abundance of the new chemical. <coughs> um, amino acids are the monomers of proteins, it says here. And if you take a look at the diagram, you'll notice that you have a central carbon. That central carbon is surrounded by an amino group and an acid group or a carboxyl group. So the name amino acid, that makes sense. Uh, a third covalent bond is, is uh, occupied by this hydrogen right here. And then what makes amino acids different, and you can see there are 20 different amino acids naturally, is what's called the R group. The R group can be charged, it can be large, it can be small, it can be hydrophobic, it can be hydrophilic. Uh, those are terms we'll take a look at next week, but hydrophobic basically means water, fear, fear of water, so these guys uh, are repelled by water, and hydrophilic, these guys, um, if we can be anthropomorphic, uh, hydrophilic means that they, uh, these chemicals will seek out water and uh, be attracted to water, if you will. So um, these R groups, which make the amino acids, are essential in determining the characteristics of these different amino acids. So, so each amino acid has specific properties based on its structure. And here's another slide that uh, goes over that a little bit more and shows you in red this time all of the different uh, R groups that make the amino acids different. <clears throat> there are some amino acids that, uh, are, uh, that can be synthesized in a laboratory, uh, but these are the 12 that are you know, sometimes you'll hear that there are about 20 different amino acids. Well, what that means is that there, there are 20 different amino acids that, that are typical in your, um, in your diet. Uh, these are, um, amino acids are attached together by, by peptide bonds. And then also um, these uh, amino acids are linked together by dehydration synthesis that we covered later. Um, we're running out of time. So I want to go to the last slide about nucleic acids um, so that you know that nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides and their job is to store genetic information. So again, we're going to have a much, uh, much longer time to discuss nucleic acids, but uh, we'll see uh, as you fill out your, your information for uh, this week's lab, you have uh, the monomer, and the function. And here are two examples of nucleic acids. Uh, there's deoxyribonucleic acid, which all living things have, and it's a double-stranded molecule. And then you have RNA, which is a copy of just a little bit of DNA, which is essential in protein synthesis. So we're going to cut right here. Um, thanks for coming to the lecture on organic chemistry. Um, take a look at the rest of the slides on your own. Uh, before you take a uh, before you take the quiz, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Okay, uh, have a great uh, rest of your week, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.